Okay, guys, it's time for some boost. We've got a Vortex supercharger. We've got an air-to-water intercooler. We've got a blow-through carburetor. The question is, what intake do we use? What's the air fuel distribution on a single-plane intake? What's the air fuel distribution on a dual-plane intake? I don't know. Let's find out. Hello, everybody. I'm Richard Holdner. Yes, welcome to the channel. Today, we're taking a look at Air fuel distribution part two. That's right. If you take a look back at part one, I ran two different intake manifolds on an LS, both of them carbureted, a single plane and a dual plane. And what we were looking at is the difference in air fuel distribution in the different intake manifolds. We also took a look at what happens when we measure the air fuel, you know, back in the collector like we normally do versus measuring in each cylinder. That's right, we ran 802 sensors to compare the difference between, hey, what do we see when we tune versus what's actually really there. Now here in part two, we're gonna do the same test. We're just throwing in some boost. That's right, we got a Vortex supercharger blowing through a CSU carburetor with the same two intake manifolds. So I'll show you naturally how much power we gain from adding the blower because that's cool i'm going to show you the change in air fuel between the two different intake manifolds and then we're going to take a look at the individual air fuel offered by each of the intake designs and find out did the air fuel get any better once we added boost if you haven't already please go check out part one of this video where we ran our naturally aspirated ls combination carbureted with a single plane and a dual plane and we monitored the air fuel in a variety of different ways we had 802s we had a single o2 and we compared them to figure out what was going on in individual cylinders relative to you know normally the way that we do it just put an o2 sensor in the exhaust and we're kind of monitoring at least one bank and a lot of times we switch it back and forth but what's going on there or at least the information that you get from a single o2 sensor does not match what's going on for multiple o2 sensors or at least eight o2 sensors so you're monitoring in all the cylinders to find out what the air and fuel distribution is in each one of the cylinders but let's take a look now as i promised this is part two we're going to take a look at what happens when we add boost to the equation in this case boost came in the form of a vortex supercharger we ran an intercore and we also ran this as a blow through carbureted application so that we can continue with the same carbureted intake manifolds that we used in part one namely the Edelbrock Performer RPM dual plane and the Edelbrock Victor Jr. single plane. What we're trying to find out is, is there a difference in air fuel distribution uh, between the different manifolds? And then now we're going to find out, is there a difference between an NA combination and a blow-through combination? So let's jump right in. First, let's find out how much power the Vortex Supercharger added, because it added quite a bit in this case. And we can take a look. This was the power output of our 4.8 liter, basically a stock block crank rods that had the, the small little do small dome JE forged pistons from the factory pistons being damaged long ago. It had a set of trick flow two of five heads, had the factory truck manifold, or <laughs> truck manifold. It had the RPM intake manifold, and we ran this with a Brian Tooley Racing. This was a, a positive displacement blower cam. We'll go ahead and put the specs up here. On the blower cam, you can see it's pretty good size, really wide LSA, which combined with these being carbureted intake manifolds and it being the cam being big enough, and also this being a 4.8, it tended to want to make peak power at a fairly high RPM. And then when we combine that with the rising boost curve of a centrifugal supercharger, it wants to rev even higher. We limited this to 7,000 RPM, but as you can see, power is still climbing. So run in naturally Aww. aspirated trim with inch and three quarter long tube headers. Our combination produced 440 horsepower with the dual plane intake manifold and 352 foot pounds of torque. Here's what happened after we added the Vortex supercharger. You can see I'm going to go ahead and move myself up here. I'm going to cooperate here. So I'm going to go ahead and label these. This is our NA horsepower combination. This is our supercharged horsepower combination. The other two, this is our supercharged torque, and this is our NA torque. And as you can see, we picked up a lot of power. We went from 440 horsepower to right at 800. And honestly, on this run, we shut it off 100 RPM early, but it was climbing at a rate of just over 20 horsepower per 100 RPM. So you can extrapolate the next 100 RPM, but this is an 800 horsepower combination. So we're looking at gaining, you know, not quite 400 horsepower, but almost 400 horsepower. And for those that are interested in the boost down here uh, at the start, at, down at 3,500 RPM, started at 4.3 pounds and rose to a peak out at uh, the peak engine speed 
of 15.8 PSI, and this is on our dual plane. So now let's take a look and see what happened when we did the same thing on our single plane mount. We've taken a look at the power gains offered by the Vortex Supercharger on the dual plane intake manifold on the Performer RPM, and we're gonna show you real quickly the power gains offered when we were running the single plane intake manifold. This is our NA power Whoa. curve, 429 horsepower and 351 foot-pounds of torque. Again, if you take a look at the first video, you'll see why this, the single plane normally makes more peak power. This one was a little bit rich at the top. But here's what happened when we installed our Vortex Supercharger with our air-to-water intercooler and our blow-through CSU carburetor. Again, 15.6, 15.7 pounds of boost on this uh, Victor Jr. And you can see we're making big power. With the Victor Jr., it actually made a little bit more because we, we ran it all the way out to 7,000 RPM. 829 horsepower at 7,000. 621 foot-pounds of torque. Again, I'll go ahead and label these. Obviously, the very high one going up over 800 horsepower here. That's the supercharged one. And then the blue line down here, that's the NA. Those are both horsepower. And the reds are both torque. The upper one, obviously, supercharged. And the lower one, naturally aspirated. So we got good power gains, obviously, from the Vortec, which we have come to expect. Um, you know, the combination, if you size the supercharger correctly, and this was a T-trim, so it had more than enough power to support this power level. So now let's take a look at the air fuel curves of both the single plane and the dual plane under boost. We've taken a look at the power gains offered by the Vortex Supercharger, an intercooler blow-through carburetor on our carbureted LS. And as you saw, pretty big power gains, getting near 400 horsepower gain. That's a lot. So the Vortex obviously did very well and we added a lot of power. But now let's take a look at the difference between the air fuel that we're registering when we monitor the air fuel in just one exhaust pipe, either on either side of the motor, basically one bank of cylinders, one bank of four cylinders, versus the individual cylinder. So we're getting an average one way and then we're getting accurate readings the other way, but let's see what the difference is. So this is our Vortex Supercharged 4.8 liter run with the dual plane intake manifold and the blow through uh, CSU carburetor that we use on, on most things. And again, we're running an air to water intercooler on this and a Vortex T-trim. This is out at the power peak out near 7,000 is 15 plus pounds of boost, so it was doing well. But here's our air fuel curve. We started out on our load in around 3,500 at 11.3 or, or, or rather 11.1, 11.2. And it went up to 11.5, dipped back down into the 11s and then ended up a little bit over 12.2. So all this really, I know it looks like it's a big change because of the scaling. The scaling here is one air fuel point but it looks like, hey, we're getting we're getting lean, and we are. But here's one thing to understand. 12.2 uh, with really good gas and the right amount of timing and an intercooler <laughs> and a blow-through application, that's more than fine for what we're doing on the engine dyno. In fact, if you want the thing to make good peak power, which we saw this, this power curve is still climbing with the blower, 12.2 um, would certainly do this. Now, if I were running this at Bonneville or somewhere, this thing would be a lot leaner. This, especially at the top of the RPM range where we're making a lot of power, this thing would be 11.5 or less everywhere. And I wouldn't even care if it was closer to 11.0 when we're running at Bonneville. But for something where you're going through the gears, a drag race thing, this thing is actually pretty good. But let's see how this compares to the single plane intake manifold. So this is our dual plane. So here, same carburetor. As you can see, the air fuel curves are actually very, very similar. We see a little bit of a change, but you're talking about two tenths of an air fuel point. We might get one or one and a half tenth just running one run and then running another run and not making any change. So two tenths of an air fuel point, really not much. Not a big change between the in the air fuel curves between the supercharge applications of both the single plane and the dual plane manifold. It, it actually worked out fairly well. We We went from a... We started out at 11.5, dropped down to 11.2 or 3, and then ended up uh, 12.1 or so out here at the top at 7,000 RPM. So both of those looked very well. We went from the 11s to the very, very low 12s, basically. So now let's see how that compares to the individual cylinders. Were they all doing this? Okay, now we can take a look at the individual air fuel and the different cylinders. You can see I only have seven of them up here. One of them uh, didn't have enough temperature, and so it really was not reading at all. In fact, if we take a look at the pink one, which is number seven. What I'm going to do is go ahead and label all these so you know which cylinders go with which trace here and which one was lean and which one was rich. If you look at the pink one, um, that that's showing a straight 11.5 all the way across and then it finally starts uh, climbing up 
what I think was happening is there was not enough temperature in that O2 sensor, and then it started reading out at the end. So I don't think that that flat line there is actually accurate on the pink one. Like I said, we'll go ahead and label them. But if we take a look at these, we can see, and if we remember, this is with the dual plane intake manifold. And with the dual plane intake manifold, when we were taking our average reading in basically from one bank, basically in one exhaust pipe, we saw that we had a range from about 11.0 up to about 12.4. So it started out rich and, and got lean as the top. We see a decidedly different thing here. The range here, it got as lean as 14.8. And we did dip down, we can see on the blue run, which is uh, cylinder number two, we did get down right at about 10.4, 10.5. So our range was from 10.5 on the richest to 11.8. So we have a pretty big spread. I mean, that's more than four points difference between the richest and the leanest cylinder. Obviously not a good idea. But on the good news is that if we were to compare the... Um, 802s run NA versus the 802s run under boost, these things actually came together a little bit. It wasn't quite as lean under boost um, and didn't get quite as rich. These things actually bunched up a little bit more, which we'd like to see. We still have some disparity. Our green run is cylinder three and our purple run is cylinder four. And you could see those two kind of wanted to be off by themselves lean on the roll-in and kind of stayed lean. Purple came in pretty good, 12 and a half, you know, down through most of the curve, but still you'd want it, you'd want it richer than that. And, and with the green run above 13.0 at wide open throttle under boost, probably not a good idea. And this shows you why it's so important to not just take one average run from either side of the, of the motor and individual cylinders are kind of telling you the real deal and what's going on. So now let's take a look at the single plane intake. Okay, let's finish this up by taking a look at the individual cylinder air fuel running the single plane Victor Jr. intake manifold. And you can see uh, the first thing I want to tell you that is just like the dual plane under boost, things got a little better, things tightened up. Whereas before, uh, when this thing is naturally aspirated, we had a spread of 15.3 was the leanest and 10.5 was the richest. Now we're down at 13.5 being the leanest and we're still at about 10.5 being the richest. So it has pushed it down, but the bad news for that is we can get away with things being leaner when the thing is naturally aspirated than we can when the thing's under boost. So having the thing being run in the 13s at wide open throttle under boost, not a good deal. Uh, maybe on the plus side, that was happening primarily at the very load in at the early part of the RPM range where there's less boost and less potential for damage. I'd be more concerned if we were lean near the torque peak or at the horsepower peak, you know, by that time, it's making lots of boost and lots of power, and so damage can occur. But if we take a look at this, I'm going to go ahead and label these like I did before. You can see what cylinders, uh, so you can attribute which cylinder is rich and which cylinder is lean. But if we look at the blue one, that's cylinder number two, the red one, cylinder number one, and the pink one, cylinder number seven, you can see those are all the leanish ones. Um, once we passed about 4,500 RPM or so, the pink and the blue, so cylinder seven and cylinders two, were around 12 to one. And in case of cylinder two, it was down near 11 and a half. It leaned out a little bit at the top, back up to 12.5. So beyond where I would want it under boost. But red <laughs> fluctuated, hit 13.0 on two different occasions, and then even settled in above 12.5, so 12.6 or 12.7 out there at the top. So that's the cylinder that I would worry about. The other ones were down at 11, between 11 and 11.5 for a lot of the run. They were doing fairly well. But it still goes to show you, we were taking a look, when we took a look at the broad air fuel, I would say, reading one bank, taking an average of four, we saw that we were looking at between 11.1 and 12.1, so a fairly small range, but <laughs> we see a much broader range. We're looking at all the cylinders individually, and this is why, even though your tune is spot on, it's in the 11s, it's safe. Yeah, it's in the 11s, but not in all of the cylinders. Armature Holder, please make sure, like, share, subscribe. Don't forget to comment. Let me know what you think, and I'll keep testing.